Uh, Rob and David uh, gave an outline of the ambition of trying to come up with an integrative understanding across all the, the various spectra of multi-taxonomy -taxonomy research at, uh, at SAFE and uh, 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 how we might go about it. And uh, what I'd like to talk about here is one possible way of trying to make that ambition into something tractable and show, show how you can work with some of the data sets or a subset of the data sets we have and come up with new integrative understandings of the SAFE system that are only possible because we have such a rich uh, study that covers so many different aspects of, of, of a system. And what I'm going to focus on is uh, an, 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 at the starting of an attempt to, to un understand trophic energy flow through the intact forest and the logged forest and oil palm landscapes uh, 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 of SAFE. And this is very much work in progress. So we're having a, a workshop tomorrow uh, where we'll try and work through this a bit more in terms of data availability and strategies and approaches and some of the challenges of this. So this is really just to give you an outline of how this works and, uh, and also give you some, some tantalizing initial results from, from one aspect. Uh, this type of thing was attempted first in the 60s and 70s in Puerto Rico. Uh, this is a classic book uh, from, from the 70s that tried to pull together data, pulled together from the El Verde studies of the 60s and 70s. I've got a copy here, here if anybody wants to have a flick, flick through it. And it was a t fairly decent attempt. Uh, the, some of the technologies that we use now, like carbon fluxes, et cetera, weren't available then. But, but it uh, certainly provides some interesting insights of a very unusual system, an island system, hurricane dominated, so very different from, from uh, uh, the safe system uh, that, uh, uh, that, that we study. Uh, but since then, there hasn't really been much progress on, on this. And it's interesting to reflect why. I think it's a mixture of Perhaps in some ways this was premature. Some of the metrics that we think about in terms of energy and carbon flows and nutrient flows didn't have anything wider scale like Earth system science to relate to in the 1970s. And I think things have moved forward a lot in terms of the broader Earth system science now. Uh, and also it takes a lot of effort. And there have been very few studies that really work across taxa at any one single site. People either work on forest dynamics or they work on invertebrates or, or, or streams. Uh, and, and SAFE, does, I think, does provide a, a unique opportunity to try a second version of the, this type of exercise uh, uh, updated uh, for the 21st century. And this is the diagram that appears at the start of every chapter in that book where they try and look at the, the, these connections and flows and focus on different aspects of it. It's interesting that they, there are a lot of lizard and, and invertebrate specialists in that study. So you've got, they've got very big boxes there. I think if, if you did it actually in terms of energetics, you'd have the bacteria and the fungi and the plants dominating the, the, the system uh, in terms of effort. But it shows you what we try and do. And what, what we want to try and do is come up with some sort of flow diagram of energy and potentially later nutrients that, that begins to, uh, to, to, to approach to this, this level of complexity. And I'll show you later that it is possible. It isn't an impossible hope to try and do something like that. Uh, so can, can we translate El Verde in the 1960s into SAFE in, in the 21st century? Can, can we come up with a similar approach and a similar uh, way of, of tackling this? And I think we can uh, uh, with, a, with a bit of synthetic and focused effort. Uh, so why we, would we want to try and do this? I think there's a number of reasons. Yeah, maybe we'll come up with some more when we, when we think about it tomorrow. Uh, basic curiosity and insight, uh, to be able to say that a, a certain percent of primary production ends up in herbivores. It a, gives us new understanding of a system. Uh, uh, a contribution to wider understanding. As I said, there are very few places in the world that we can even attempt an exercise like this. Uh, we can try and understand how conversion to logging or oil palm shifts the resource supply available in an ecosystem and distorts the trophic structure of an ecosystem. Identify potential bottom-up and top-down constraints by looking at, at the energetics. Identify neglected pathways or other big aspects uh, of the system that we're missing in our understanding. It always tends to come down to the soil and the, uh, insufficient understanding of soil biology, uh, soil interactions uh, in particular. Uh, and uh, also, it's, it's a, as a community, it's a very useful framework for bringing together the, the diverse strands of, of research. It, it's, it's a nice way that we can bring the invertebrates and the carbon fluxes and the uh, 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 and the mammal ecology all together in a single intellectual uh, framework with the same units. Uh, and it's also a, a framework for future research and student projects that could potentially fill in gaps in our understanding uh, to help helps us direct uh, our research towards gaps. 
Uh, so I'll talk through some of the aspects. Uh, so uh, at one level, at the most basic level, we need to understand the primary production, uh, how, how much energy is being captured by plants to provide the, the chemical raw material that powers the ecosystem. And in that case, we're pretty well uh, uh, informed in InSafe, thanks to work uh, implemented by Terry uh, and her team. Uh, across that, uh, that, that gradient, we have a pretty good idea of the primary, uh, of, uh, the primary productivity and also both through these respiration measurements scaled up and through the carbon flux tower, the, the gross primary productivity, the photosynthesis, uh, and then the, the net primary productivity, the actual production of biomass, whether it's in canopy, wood and roots, and how it's allocated between those, those different components. So that, that, that basic component, the bottom of that diagram uh, from Valverde, primary production, we, we are in a pretty good position in the, uh, in the safe landscape. Uh, and we can come up with diagrams like this. This is actually from one of my former students, uh, former students Kuhn from uh, uh, Lambia, but we have similar diagrams for, for, for the different sites, intensive sites in the, uh, in the, in the safe landscape and, and, and in Maliao and Danum uh, that, that, that give us this detailed picture of, of carbon flow in, in the vegetation part of the ecosystem and, and the soils. So we, normally we think in terms of carbon units, it's pretty straightforward to convert carbon into energy. Uh, in terms of the, the energy content of carbohydrates, uh, you can just put multiplying factors and conversion factors. We can get our, our uh, meteorological data and also convert that into energy. So all the units here are megajoules per meter squared uh, per, per year. So this is uh, as an annual budget, how many megajoules of energy flow through different components. So from our MET data, we know it's about 6,600 megajoules of energy uh, coming in at the top, uh, uh, being captured, uh, uh, coming in as solar radiation, and that's converted into about 138 megajoules of gross primary production. Uh, so the, the, so compared, we've done similar work at White and Woods near Oxford, where the energy input is about half of that, uh, but the, and, the, and the primary production is about half. So the efficiency is about the same. Uh, it's about 2.1% in, in safe, in, in, the, in the old growth forests, and it's about 2.3% in white and woods. So, uh, so the actual efficiency of capturing energy is not that different in these systems. There's a, there's a lot more energy in the, in, the, in the tropical system. And then we can work out how much goes into net primary production, biomass production, and the efficiency we calculate is around 42%. So of all that photosynthesis, 42% ends up producing biomass. And we can partition that into how much is going into the canopy, leaves, flowers, fruit, how much into the wood, and the, and the fine roots for our measurements. And through experiments that we do in partitioning the respiration, we can estimate how much is being allocated to mycorrhizae below ground, that's a substantial amount. And also, I'll come back to this, because we actually, are, this is a new term we've added, which is from our mammal herbivory data, that we try and estimate what the mammals are eating and that we, don't, I'm not, we never actually directly measure because it's being consumed by the deer and, and other components as well. So we could, but we can also estimate that, and I can show later how we, cal how we calculate that. So we end up with a, with a, with a total uh, flow. For the old growth forest, we can do something similar for the logged forest. I, I won't uh, uh, go through the details of it, but uh, uh, th there are some interesting differences there that, 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 that we can see. There's, there's overall a greater efficiency uh, of photosynthesis to biomass conversion in the logged forest. Uh, there's a lot more uh, production in the ground flora in, 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 in these open areas. There's a, there's a lot more herbaceous layer uh, uh, there as well. And, and other components are, are to do shift a, a bit as well. Uh, so in terms of this diagram, we're doing pretty well with all the, with the components down here. There's always refinement and improvement, but we've got a good first order estimate of many of these components down here. And our ideal, of course, is to try and do something about what uh, these other components, what are they consuming, uh, what, uh, what is being passed from them uh, into, into other components. And overall, uh, that's a big task. It's not something that we can do in a workshop, and, but it's something that we can embark on uh, and, think, and think about. And to show you how, at least for the animal taxa, how we could approach this, I'm going to focus on one example that, that we are relatively advanced on, uh, and that is the, the, the mammals. And this is the uh, over the, the last uh, month, uh, I had an intern, Jesse Zions in particular, and, and Frederick Erickson is here, looking at uh, trying to pull, contact some of you and try and pull some of your, your taxonomic data. And thanks to Ollie Wern and Phil Chapman, we've got quite a good 
mammal data sets. So I'll focus on that as an example of what we can do. But in principle, we could do this with invertebrates, we could do this with birds, we could do this with, uh, with, with, with other components as well. Uh, so let's just focus on mammal metabolism and consumption. So how do we go from our field survey data of mammals, uh, camera traps or whatever, to, to metabolism of mammals in a, in a landscape? Uh, and uh, uh, this example isn't going to do in terms of the badgers, because we first tried this in Whiteham uh, uh, a, uh, a few years ago, but it's just to illustrate this principle. But actually, uh, on the, uh, ideally, you know, of course, we'd like to measure the metabolism of every mammal, stick an elephant in a large chamber and try and see how much is respiring. And, and so, uh, there's some practical limitations to, to that. Uh, so, well, but, but there are ways that we can get, approximate this. So the key things that we need to know are the average mass of the animal, which we can get from the literature, uh, generally, uh, the general type of animal, mammal, bird, arthropod, uh, mollusk, etc., uh, and the, the abundance, the population density, how many of those individuals are found in per unit area. Uh, and also it's useful to have some idea of what they eat. Uh, 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 how, are they omnivores? What fraction is, is vegetation versus meat uh, are the, uh, uh, in the components? And, uh, and this can be a bit of expert knowledge rather, rather than if it's not published, just an idea, an approximation. And, and the way this works, you know, we can try and prop calculate uncertainties around these estimates and propagate them through. And so, so we, we recognize that not everything is known perfectly. Uh, but if we can have this, this information, we can calculate the type of data, diagrams and data that I'm, I'm going to show you in a moment. So it's not too demanding. We're not needing to know the details of, of uh, movement and behavior uh, and, and population dynamics, just, just those, those simple uh, uh, estimate, those simple parameters. And so how do we go from body mass to consumption or energy? Uh, there's a limited amount of literature out there, and, and essentially it's all linked to metabolic scaling, that larger things, paper, have, have more metabolism, but the metabolism per unit mass is slower in a larger organism than it is in a smaller organism, approximately a three quarters type relationship. And so if here, this is the daily energy expenditure uh, versus body weight. This is from, from empirical studies in different systems. And you see that this is for, for a variety of birds and there's a broad uh, relationship over the slope of 0.67 in, in this case. But something that doesn't matter what the exact slope is, but it's an empirical relationship that we can, we can use uh, practically to try and go from body mass to, to energy uh, expen expenditure. Uh, uh, and this is for similar data from, for a variety of mammal species, showing that across a range of mammals, you, can, you, you end up with a, with a similar a relationship with a slope of a 0.771 as well. So another practical empirical relationship that we can use. Uh, okay, so for our mammal, our badger of 10 kilograms, we can calculate the daily energy expenditure. So it's about 5,000 kilojoules per day per badger. And then uh, we want to know how that converts into a food intake. So we need to know a little bit about uh, the partitioning of the diet over the, the full year uh, of that uh, animal. And this is where we draw on expert opinion or people's insight into, in, in, into that diet. So we know badgers are about two thirds eat earthworms and slugs, 17% uh, arthropods, about 20% uh, fruit in the, in the autumn. And so then we can convert the in intake into consumption demand of those components. How much fruit is, is required to power that badger? How much earthworms are, are required? And there's a number of metrics that we can, again, get from the literature. Generally, you know, if, a, if a carnivore is eating an earthworm, uh, what are the, what are the uh, uh, what's the general efficiency of that? There's, there's lots of literature value. So consumption, uh, the total consumption is equal to the assimilation, uh, what's taken, uh, 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 what's absorbed by the animal and the ingestion, you know, what's, what's uh, excreted by the animal. So we can work out in particular, we, we, the, the literature values of assimilation efficiency, the, this ratio, and that'll vary from a deer eating leaves to, to a badger eating earthworms. But, but, but there's enough literature out there to estimate a, lo a, a lot of those. Uh, those parameters. And similarly, we can do uh, of that assimilated uh, food stuff, how much goes into production, into biomass versus the, the respiration and the metabolism of the animal and get a production efficiency. So, <coughs> so, the, so the way we, that we can then convert the energy expenditure into food intake is to divide by the energy in a particular food stuff. What's the energy content of an earthworm or a blade of grass? Uh, do a correction for the moisture content. 
of, of the, the material, and then have the assimilation efficiency. What fraction of that leaf or that earthworm ends up being assimilated versus just passing through and being adjusted. But the, 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 there are uh, tables or values around for those. So here's an example of a table of energy content and moisture content in different types of foodstuffs that we can use as a, as, as a first approximation. Uh, and these are assimilation efficiencies. So you can see a deer eating browse has an efficiency of 32%. Uh, very little, most of the material just passes through the deer. Only 30% ends up being assimilated. Whereas a, a carnivore eating vertebrates has an assimilation efficiency of around 85%. So much more is assimilated and much less ingested. Uh, has a similar data for, for a number of bird types and, and uh, 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 taxa there as well. So we have these, these sort of data that we can use. In, so essentially what we're building up is a big spreadsheet, a big, a big uh, sort of bookkeeping approach to, 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 to calculate these numbers. So this means that now we can actually assign for earthworms and slugs these, these parameters of moisture content, energy content, assimilation efficiency, do something similar for arthropods and for fruit, and come up with a food intake per day required for each of those components. And then also from the assimilation efficiency, we can also estimate the, the ingestion, the amount of defecation, uh, so how much is cycling through, 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 through that as well. But uh, this ends up giving us an estimate of the total energy consumption per day and how it's part partitioned between different, uh, different foods with different assimilation efficiencies uh, and, and moisture contents. Uh, and so that, that's for one individual animal. So to go from the animal to the population in a per unit area, we need to know uh, population uh, density. Uh, as a critical variable. Uh, if it's a very heterogeneous landscape, we may want to think about lateral movements, badgers foraging outside of the forest into the, the grasslands or uh, uh, other components. If there's an active or present season, it could be in winter, it would be hibernation, uh, but it could be migration in, in, in some tropical species when they're not in the system and they're out of the system, we can think about that. And we come up with a, a total energy consumption per square meter per year uh, uh, off badgers in that ecosystem. So we can do this now. I'm going to show this. Yeah, I'm almost done. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to show this for, uh, the, uh, for, the, for, for the mammal data from SAFE. So I'm going to ask a quick quiz, though. See if, see if, uh, and Rob's not allowed. I think I gave you some clues yesterday. Uh, so which mammal dominates food consumption in the intact forest? Uh, any, anybody want to venture a guess? Bearded pig. Bearded pig. I had a deer. Okay, uh, all right. Uh, and in the logs forest? Bearded pig. Bearded pig, okay, there's bearded pig fans there. And the oil palm? Rats. Okay, all right, okay, we've got, we got the. Uh, okay, and uh, how does the energetic resource change from intact forest to logged forest? Will there be more energy available for mammals or less energy in the logged forest? More, okay. Well, uh, how much more? 10% more, 50% more, 100% more? 22. 22, okay. <laughs> uh, and okay, well, the last one, we'll, we'll see what fraction of photosun sunshine ends up in mammals. But we'll, we'll have a look at that in a moment. Uh, okay, so this is the data for the old growth forest and food consumption. I've kept units the same for the other ones, which is why everything is crunched up. So it's the deer dominates the, the energetic consumption. The bearded pig comes in number third, so, so yeah, it's still significant. But actually, you see three of the top four, or four, uh, actually four of the top five are, 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 are deer. So it's a deer-dominated system in terms of, in terms of consumption uh, in, in the old growth system. Uh, and if we look at the, the logged forest on the same scale, so I've kept the horizontal axis identical, you can see, firstly, just the overall consumption of the top five is much, much more. There's much more resources available in the logged forest than there is in, in the old growth forest. And the deer are still there, but the, the elephant and the banteng are also doing very well in the, in the logged forest. So they come up, up the rankings there. And this is in the oil palm. With everything is much less, uh, with, with the munchak uh, doing, doing the best out of, out of what's there. According to these estimates, and I'd like to talk to the mammal people and you know, think about how much, how much confidence we have. So if we sum up over the uh, the total consumption by mammals, uh, not just the herbivores, in the three systems. And this is the type of insight that we can get by, by doing this trophic analysis. This is the total resource availability to mammals in the logged forest, in the old growth forest, in the logged forest, 
and in the oil palm. So you see there's a doubling, 100% increase pretty much, in the uh, amount of energy available for mammal to mammals, or being consumed by mammals in the logged forest system compared to, to the old growth. And that's because I think there's a, there's a lot of herbaceous uh, layer. You can see the biggest change is, is in, the, in, the, in the leaf consumption here, uh, that the deer are able to, to, cons to, to access and, and consume. And uh, a little, but there's also some increase in, in fruit production as well. Uh, and it, you can re also we can then relate back to the plant data. This is uh, the, the last figure. So we can divide the, uh, the total consumption in, in mammals by the NPP, the total primary production. And we see that about in the old growth forest is about 13% of the primary production ends up in mammals, 18% uh, in the logged forest. Uh, or we can do it by terms of photosynthesis as well. So about 5.5% of photosynthesis ends, 5.5% of the captured sunshine ends up in, in mammals and up to about 8% in, in the log forest. And these are quite high numbers. Uh, normally in places like Whiteham, we, go, we have numbers about 3 or 4% in terms of fraction of NPP. So this is a, there's much more capture by, by uh, this deer-dominated system in some ways than, than I, I anticipated. So there's some, some nice surprises in the data. So, so just to, to conclude, uh, we have a workshop uh, tomorrow to look at some of these, to discuss partially some of the issues around this in terms of tackling uh, components, some of the things like the soil and the litter are particularly challenging uh, uh, compared to some of the, the basic taxa. Think through data availability. Uh, uh, Frederick's been and Zed Jesse have been approaching some of you, but hopefully this will encourage you to, to see what limited data we need and what new insights can emerge from very limited data. Uh, think about moving from energy to nutrients by combining stoichiometry with this and actually moving to nutrient transfer diagrams for the same data. And think a little bit about what questions we can ask uh, with, with this sort of approach. Okay, thank you.